this morning. Open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We should always go, woohoo, we made it to another chapter. Right, we're making progress. Chapter 15 is where we're going to be at this morning as we're reminded of the importance of the resurrection of Christ from verses 1 uh, to 11 this morning. Um, like chapter 13 uh, is known as the love chapter, right? It's all about uh, love. Chapter 15 is all about the resurrection. Um, if you remember, uh, it's been a while. I, I preached chapter 13 in one sermon because it was just 13 verses and that was doable. Uh, but but uh, uh, in just a little wisdom and insight, I, I figured I better break up chapter 15, right? And just take little chunks at a time. There's 58 verses and, and we don't want to be here all day. And I don't want to be here all day uh, preaching and you don't want to be listening to me preach all day long. Uh, some of you uh, think my sermons are too long already as it is. No amens. <laughs> Hold your amens uh, on, on that. So besides all that, I think the resurrection of Christ and the implications of the resurrection of Christ are too important for us to kind of just speed through or to rush through, right? That we need to be able to to understand the, the importance of, of the resurrection and, and the importance of it and, and the weight that it bears on the gospel that we share with other people, right? We need to, we need to be well grounded in understanding uh, of the, the, the resurrection. Now, uh, to be clear, all of Scripture is important, right? Uh -huh. we, can we all agree on that? Yes. But, I, but I think we can also agree that there are some, some parts of Scripture, some issues that, that Scripture deals with that has a little more weight. All right, and, and so so we need to spend a little more time in those areas. And I believe the resurrection is is one of those areas, uh, and so the, the resurrection is one of those subjects that we must have a firm grasp of, so that we can communicate its importance to those that we're sharing the gospel with. So, what is so important about the resurrection of Christ? Right? You ever you ever, you ever, you ever thought about that? What? Why is it so important? Why does the resurrection of Christ matters? Well, what's so important about the resurrection of Christ is that the resurrection of Christ is what makes the gospel good news. Without the resurrection of Christ, then we have nothing to celebrate. That's right. If Christ was not risen, if Christ, if the, if the, the women showed up at that tomb and the, and the stone was still covering the hole, the entryway, and they had to get somebody to move the stone away, and they opened up and flies came out and stench come out, that's bad news. Right. That's bad news. That's why the resurrection of Christ matters so much. If Jesus had not been bodily raised from the dead on the third day after his death on the cross, his death would have been meaningless because it would have accomplished absolutely nothing regarding God's wrath towards our sin. Right? Nothing. It would be meaningless. There would be no point to it whatsoever. I think it's great that we go around telling people to repent of their sins and to believe in Jesus but most time we just we do, we we stop too soon. We'll say we'll tell people that Jesus died for my sins, or we'll tell people that you know that Jesus died for your sins, and you say, well, okay, yeah, okay, that's I do that quite often. We're not going far enough. It's not just that Jesus died for our sins; it's that He was buried for our sins, and that He rose again from the dead for our sins. Right? Just just saying that Jesus died for your sins is not sufficient. That's not giving the whole story. I like what Denny Aiken explains the gospel and the need to place more emphasis on the resurrection than most of us do. He says this, as the gospel emphasizes one, that Jesus literally died, two, that Jesus was actually buried, and three, Jesus was physically raised or resurrected Lord. It should go without saying that the, the other two parts of the gospel do not matter if this third part is not true. Whether or not Jesus died, there is only one way to know that his death for our sins was efficacious, and that is the resurrection. The cross is the payment. The empty tomb is the proof. The payment was approved and accepted. Amen. Right? And so we need to be clear. I mean, it's, it's, it's wonderful. I, we, there's lots of songs about the shedding of the blood and the old rugged cross. And I don't know if there is one that, that says the, the old empty tomb. Right? But that would be a good one to write, right? Because right. that's important, right? That's a vital part of, of, of what Jesus did for us, his work to atone for our sins and the, the payment that was received. So the next time someone says Jesus died for our sins, I, I would encourage you to maybe politely say, and? <laughs> right? 
and, and and to kind of prod them on. Okay, what what else? Right? It's yes, that's part of it. But what what the rest of the story? And right? And he was buried, right? Because only dead people get buried, right? Right? So he died for our sins. He was buried for our sins, but he was also raised from the dead for our sins, right? Giving us victory over sin, death, and hell, right? That's that's important. Let's give them the, the whole story. As Paul Harvey would say, let's give them the rest of the story, not just part of the story. At, 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 at Easter time, as Christians, we're remembering Christ's sacrificial death for us, but more important than that, we're celebrating His victorious resurrection. Right? We, we grieve. We, we, we look, look at, at Good Friday, and we think about what happened then, and, and the cross, and the suffering, and the anguish, and all those things. But, but what we celebrate, what we're celebrating at Easter is Resurrection Sunday, right? right? That the tomb was empty, that, that death was defeated. That's what we celebrate. You see, without the resurrection of Christ, we would have nothing to celebrate. Nothing to celebrate. Verse 17, a little further down, we'll, we'll get to it, tells us that if Christ is not risen, our faith is futile and we are still in our sins. Yeah. That's nothing to celebrate no. if that were the case. Then the next verse, verse 18, also tells us that those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. That's nothing to celebrate either, right? They're all the ones that have placed their faith in Christ and, and had the hope of an everlasting life and all those things that the gospel was told to them, if, if Christ had not risen from the dead, they've perished in their sins. They're, they're not in glory. They're, they, they would not be in heaven. They, they would, would be in a place of eternal torment if the resurrection was not true. But praise the Lord, Christ is risen. Amen. Christ is risen. Our faith is not futile and our sin has been forgiven. Praise the Lord, Christ is risen. And those who have fallen asleep have not perished and their souls are with Christ right now in heaven. In fact, when Christ returns from for His church, when Christ returns for us, those who remain, guess who are coming with Him? Those who are there now. That's right. They will be with Him. And I was kind of thinking about that. That would be kind of awesome in one sense, but also terrible in another sense because like we're already here and now we're going to have to leave here. We're going to have to leave the glory of heaven and come back and be reunited with our glorified bodies, and then we're going to head back. It's kind of hard to get our minds around all that stuff. And sometimes I overthink things, and maybe you do too, but that's just how my mind works. And so sorry, I'm not sorry, uh, for, for sharing that with you. So we have this to look forward to. But we'll be taking a, 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 talking about that a lot more in the next few weeks. But for today, we just need to deal with the, the first three truths, I believe, regarding the resurrection of Christ. And so for us to do that, let's grab our Bibles and stand as we honor the reading of God's Word together. Verses 1 through 11, chapter 15, uh, Paul begins there in verse 1. He says, Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received and in which you stand, but which also you were saved, if you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. And He is, was seen by Cephas, then by the twelve. After that, He was seen by over five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part uh, remain in, in the present, or to the present, but some have fallen asleep. After that, He was seen by James, and then by all the apostles, then last of all, he was seen by me also uh, as my one born out of due time. For I am the least of the apostles who am not worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And by his grace toward me was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. Therefore, whether it was I or they, so we preached and so you Believe, mm -hmm. um, Father in heaven, we we come before you this morning, grateful and and humble uh, by the fact that that we have the privilege of gathering in this place and worshiping you in spirit and in truth. And Father, as we uh, begin to look at this passage this morning, we ask that you would be our teacher. I may be the preacher, but your spirit is the teacher. And so, God, we ask that you would teach us your word, help us to 
the grasp of the the, the magnitude and the significance of the resurrection of Christ. And it's bearing not only on us who, who have believed, but the bearing on those who will believe. And so, Father, help us today. Help us to rejoice those who have already believed. And we look forward to the resurrection, our resurrection. And, and Father, help us to share that message to others and they would have the same hope that we have. We love you and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Up to this point in the letter, Paul has addressed uh, several issues, several serious issues that were occurring there in the church of Corinth. He's addressed the serious issues regarding division in the church, dissension in the church, uh, issues regarding sexual immorality in the church, right? The, I mean, some, some gross sin that was happening that even the pagans didn't approve of and the, and the church was kind of looking the other way and not willing to address those things. And he, so he addressed those things. He he's addressed issues regarding dishonoring the uh, headship in the church, uh, issues regarding participating in the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner as a member of the church. He's dealt with that. And as we covered the past few weeks, he's also addressed uh, issues, serious issues of the misuse of spiritual gifts uh, within the church, right? Uh, doing things not, not in order, not doing things decently or in order. And so we've covered all this. And now here in chapter 15, I believe Paul is going to address the most serious issue of all up to, up to this point, right? There, there was a false teaching that was making its way into the church that denied the resurrection of Christ. And, and I, I believe Paul was just perplexed, right, about this. That this was, you know, why, why is this happening? Why is denying the resurrection of Christ the most serious issue of all? Some of you may be kind of thinking about that yourself. And I would just answer it this way, because denying the resurrection of Christ is the same thing as denying the gospel. Yeah. Right? Well, what are you believing in? If you don't believe in the resurrection of Christ, what are you actually placing your faith in? Right? What good is a dead Savior? Amen. Right? <laughs> no, no good at all. If, if He couldn't even save Himself, how is He going to save you? Right? A dead Savior is no Savior at all. In fact, any gospel that denies the resurrection of Christ is a false gospel, and nobody can be saved by believing a false gospel. Right? right? You, you place your faith in the, the wrong things when you believe the wrong things, the, 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 the false uh, gospel. In his letter to the Galatian church, Paul expressed this same frustration, this same disappointment in how some of them had actually begun to turn away from Christ because of a false teaching that was perverting the gospel there in, in Galatia, right? If you remember, it was, it was if, yes, faith in Christ, you need to do that, but you also need to be circumcised and keep the law. So basically, you need to become a Jew plus believing in Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And he said, that, that's not the gospel. That's not the gospel. That's a perversion of the gospel. In Galatians 1, 6-9, let's just look at it. He, this is Paul again. He says, I marvel that you are turning away so soon from Him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed, as we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you have received, let him be accursed. You see, this wasn't just a, a, a Corinth issue. This was a, a everywhere issue, right? Anywhere the true gospel is going forth, you better believe the enemy is going to be sowing seeds of a false gospel right, right alongside it, right? Wheat and tares is what kind of the right. Bible talks about growing up together. And sometimes it's hard to tell the two. I tell you what, I think about this issue of, of preaching a, a false gospel or a perverted gospel. I don't want to ever be found guilty of that. Mm. I don't want to ever be accused of that, right? And I'm pretty sure that none of you want to be accused of that either, being found guilty of sharing a false gospel with the lost. False gospels give people a false hope of being reconciled with God, right? right? It's snake oil, right? It's just, yeah, 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 just... This is what you need to do this or believe this or do these things. And yeah, God God forgives you and you're reconciled with God and you'll go to heaven. You'll, you'll go to a better place when you die. No, you won't. Not if you believe a false gospel. No, you won't. But you think you will. Right? That's the problem with a false gospel. That, that was Paul's 
concerns that false gospels give people a false hope of being reconciled with God. People that believe a false gospel will hear, I never knew you, depart from me, you practice lawlessness when they stand before the Lord when they die. They're going to be expecting to be welcomed in and they're going to hear, depart from me, I never knew you. But guess what? At that point, too late. Right. Too late. They, they died in their deception. Let's make sure that we are individual believers that share and believe the true gospel. Let's make sure that we are a church that preaches and believes the true gospel. So what is included in the true gospel? The true gospel includes the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Christ didn't just die for our sins. Christ wasn't just buried for our sins. Christ was resurrected from the dead for our sins also. That's the true gospel. That's what people need to know. The first truth that we see in our text this morning regarding the resurrection of Christ is that the resurrection of Christ is beneficial. It's beneficial. Verses 1 and 2. Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received and in which you stand, but which also you were saved, if you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. Unless you believed in vain. In vain. That's a troubling little add-on there, I believe. The Bible tells us that we know that eternal salvation is the free gift of God. We also know because the Bible says that we're saved by grace through faith and not by our works. That's Ephesians 2, 8, 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. God's free gift of eternal salvation isn't beneficial to us until we receive it as the gift that it is. It's not beneficial to us. I was thinking about an illustration to kind of communicate this point, and I started thinking about gift cards, right? We like gift cards. We like giving gift cards. Isn't it easy, easier just to give someone a gift card? It's not as personal, right? But, but you, you give them a gift card, and they can get what they want with it. They said that there's an estimated, let's see where my number's at, $23 billion left unused on gift cards. I wonder how many gospel presentations are left unused. Sharing the gospel thousands of times, hundreds of thousands, of millions of times, and it's good. It's good seed. It is the gospel, but it goes unused. And if it's unused, guess what it is? It's not beneficial. That's right not beneficial at all, right? It's just sitting there. It's, it's, it's the gift of everlasting life. It's the gift of being reconciled with God. And, and there it is. It's on the table and it has your name on it, but it doesn't benefit you until you lay hold of it, until you receive it as the gift that it is. Like an unused gift card, the gospel is of no benefit to us unless it's both received and made use of. The gospel must be both, both received and believed to be beneficial. It's not enough that someone understands the gospel and, and believes that the gospel is true. Lots of people would give acknowledgement and, and they would say, yes, I, I understand that I, and I even believe that. You see, the gospel and all that it entails, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ must be received and believed by faith for it to be beneficial. By faith. That's the key to all this. In light of a report that some false teachings that deny the resurrection of Christ, uh, Paul felt it was necessary for him to, to remind the Corinthian believers of the true gospel. The true gospel is the gospel is the one that he had preached to them. The true gospel is the gospel that, that, that they had received in which they stood, is what Paul said here. The true gospel is the gospel that saved them. Right? He's right. quick to point that out. It, but, he, but, he, but he adds this, though. He says, if they held fast the word which Paul preached to them, and then he adds that last little part, unless they had believed in vain. That's scary. That's scary. Did you know that it's possible to believe in vain? Yes. <laughs> right? We should know. We should know. Because we sit in a, in a sanctuary right now that's probably 80% empty. 80% empty. If we go by our, our membership, 100, 160, 200, whatever its bloated numbers are, 
Not realistic. We should know that you can believe in vain. We should know because we all know people that have professed to believe in Jesus and were even baptized and yet they do not hold fast to the word that they profess to believe in. They're not in church. There's no desire to be in church. There's no good spiritual fruit that is being bared in their lives. Right? Do you know anybody like that? I do. You probably relate to people like that. You've got people in your family that are described that way. They believe, they walk the aisle, they profess their faith, and uh, we baptize them, and I, I, maybe I've been baptized. Somebody asked me before, what's one of the biggest challenges or one of the biggest disappointments that you deal with as a pastor? And you know, in you know, almost 10 years now, and I say it's, a, it's coming to the realization that I've baptized lost people. That's what frustrates me. That's what's disappointing to me. How do, I don't know. I'm not, we're not, we don't forbid them to come. And we do the best that we can to make sure they understand the gospel. We understand, that they understand what they're believing and what they're professing. But beyond that, I have no control. Right. That's what's disappointing. Is to know that you're baptizing people. Only to find out that a, a short time later, a week or a month or maybe even a year later, they're, they're gone. They're out the doors. They're not in church. not doing anything. Just... Maybe making posts on Facebook about saying, well, you don't have to go to church to be a Christian. What kind of nonsense is that? Why would you not want to be in church if you're a Christian? Why would you not want to be with believers if you're a Christian? Why would you not want to be studying God's Word, hearing God's Word proclaimed if you are a Christian? Amen. If you don't want to worship Jesus now, why would you want to worship Jesus in eternity? Exactly. It doesn't make any sense. The devil has lots of people to see. Lots of people are going to hear, depart from me, I never knew you. They believe the gospel is true and they believe that Jesus is the Son of God. They even believe in His death, burial, and resurrection. But you know what they do? They, they, they believe in the facts about Jesus. And so what they do is they believe in Jesus in the same way that the demons of hell believe in Jesus. Right? They'll, get, they'll believe the facts, all these things about Jesus and all this the, the, the stuff that we, we know to be true, the, the, devil, the, the demons knew Jesus was. They didn't deny any of that, right? It, but, but, but still, they can't be saved. And so that's, that's the problem here. That's what it means to believe in vain. There have been countless number of people that have already discovered that they have believed in vain. But they have discovered it when it was too late. They discovered it when it was too late. And sadly, there will be a countless number more that do the same before Christ returns. What's even scarier is that some people that have believed in vain are still actively involved within a local church. They're still here. They're still here among us. They have believed in vain, right? They, they're religiously lost and don't even know it. Religiously lost and don't even know it. They might be the most faithful attenders to a church, but they're lost. Because they have believed in vain. That's the kind of people that Jesus was primarily referring to in Matthew 7, right? 21 and 23. Religious people. Talking to the Jews, but I think we can apply it to Christians as well. Or people that would claim to be Christians. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied your name? Cast out demons in your name and done many wonders in your name and then I will declare to them I never knew you depart from me you who practice lawlessness mm. it's kind of scary isn't it mm. but that's the reality so how can we know with certainty that we are saved right how can we know with certainty that we have not believed in vain I believe we can know because our lives are still benefiting from the gospel it wasn't just a, a, a one-time thing. It wasn't just, I have believed in Jesus and so I'm moving on. I got my, my hell insurance and so now I'm going to go back to living the, any way I want to live. I, that's, you're, we're still benefiting from the gospel. The gospel is still good news to us. We can know because our lives are still benefiting from the resurrection of Christ. We can know because we are continuing to receive and to stand on and to believe in the truth of God's Word. It's not something that we did 10 years ago or 50 years ago. It's something we're still doing now. Amen? Amen. 
We're still doing it now. We're still digging in. We're still studying. We're still reading. We're still praying. We're still serving. We're still telling people about Jesus, right? We're doing all these things. The gospel is still producing good works in us. The facts that we have been saved by grace and through faith in a person and work of Christ still making a difference in our lives. It's his death, His burial, and His resurrection still make a difference in our lives. It still matters to us. It's still We're still passionate about that. Still gets us excited. We're not crusty and cold. So we think about someone that's still hungering and thirsting for Christ. Hungering and thirsting for the Word of God. Being faithful to God. Right? Does that describe you this morning? Does I describe you this morning? If it does, you should be supremely confident that you were saved. I'm not saying that you nailed every day. There are some rough days along the way. There, there are some days where I don't feel like doing anything either. I'm just like you, that I struggle just like you do. Maybe even more so than some of you. But I have more good days than bad days. Man. I'm supremely confident that I am saved. But, but, but if this doesn't describe you this morning, you have good reason to be concerned that you are someone that has believed in vain. If you have no desire, even if you're here this morning, even if you're faithful to attend, that's, that's, that's kind of, this is just something that you do. You were raised in church, and so that's what you do. You just, you, you're like a trained dog. This, this is what you do. Every Sunday you come to church. You don't, you don't really want to be here, but you just, you just, this is what you do. This is all you know to do. You have no desire for, for the Word of God. No desire for the things of God. No desire to pray. No desire to, to, to study your Bible. Anything. No desire to tell people about Jesus. You may be someone that has believed in me. I'm just putting it out there. Maybe nobody else will tell you, but I will. Because you need to know. I don't want you to be someone that's going to live your whole life in deception and stand before God and, and hear the parking I never knew you. Right. I don't want that for you. I don't want that for you. So I'm willing to, to put it out there for you to, to ponder for yourself. But here's the good news. If you're sitting there this morning and you say, I, I may be one of the people, Brother Mike. I just, you're right. But you, you almost describe me word for word. I don't have a desire to pray. I don't have a desire to study God's Word. I I, I, I've never shared the gospel with anyone before. I think I may be someone that has believed in vain because I'm, I'm a member of the church. I've been baptized, all those things. I'm in a membership role, but, but, but hearing what you've said and looking at what God's Word says, I, I may be someone that has believed in vain. The good news is for you is that you still have breath in your lungs. Amen. And that God would reveal to you that you have believed in vain. That can change today. Right. You, you can go from being someone that's deceived and just kind of going through the religious motions that you've been going through for years or even decades to being someone that is gloriously saved today. That someone that will have a zeal and a desire to, to, to grow in God and a zeal and a desire to study God's Word, a zeal and a desire to pray, a zeal and a desire to tell others how they can be saved too. All those things, that can happen for you today. That's right. right? Repent of your sins. Place your faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and surrender your whole life to Him. Not just parts. Your whole life. Don't just believe in the facts about Jesus. I told Leslie this a few weeks back because sometimes we emphasize Bible knowledge so much. And there's nothing wrong with that, but don't, don't, that's not, there's more to it than just knowing the Bible. There's not going to be a Bible quiz at the gates of heaven. That's not going to be how you enter in because you can answer a bunch of questions. There's not a, a questionnaire. And some of us are saying, praise God for that. <laughs> praise God for that. You see, the gospel, the resurrection of Christ is beneficial, but it's only beneficial to those that have not believed in vain. Number two, the second truth that we see in our text regarding the resurrection of Christ is that the resurrection of Christ is verifiable. There's proof, verses 3 to 8, For I delivered you first of all that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. 
And then he was seen by Cephas, then by the twelve. And after that he was seen by over five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain to the present. But some have, have fallen asleep. After that he was seen by James, then by all the apostles. Then last of all he was seen by me also as one by one born out of time. I believe Paul was still giving a defense for the gospel that he had preached to the Corinthians here. It's likely that the false teachers, you know what, you know what people will do that are being accused of doing something wrong? Don't they spin it around and, and accuse the accusers? You're, you're, you, they're calling me a false teacher? Let me tell you what he teaches. That's probably what was happening. And so he's having to kind of backtrack some and remind them of, of the gospel they had preached and kind of lay things out for them once again. And so he's dealing with these false teachers and these accusations. But he's trying to, uh, to again, give a defense for the gospel. And he's reminding them that the gospel wasn't Paul's gospel. The gospel was God's gospel. <laughs> Uh, again, I would remind you that there were many there in the church that, that, that rejected Paul. They didn't like Paul, and so they denied his apostleship, and so they would probably be under, they didn't want to listen to Paul. They didn't want to believe anything he said, and so he's dealing with some of that here. But he's saying, this wasn't my idea. This wasn't, this isn't my good news. This isn't my gospel. This is God's good news. This is God's gospel. Like you and me and every other believer, Paul was just a messenger. Paul delivered the same gospel to the Corinthians that he also received. What was the gospel message that he received? What was the gospel message that he had delivered to the Corinthians? That Christ died for our sins, that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day. That's it. That's right. right? That's what he had received, and that's what he had delivered to them. That was consistent with what Jesus told his disciples on multiple occasions, right? He would say that I'm going to be arrested, and I'm going to... Uh, be rejected and despised and all these things and, and, and crucified and even then the, the disciples they were like I, I, I'm not, either I'm not listening to this I don't believe this I'm not receiving any of this but, but that was what Jesus told them over and over again but Paul's main point was that the Corinthians should verify everything for themselves if you don't believe me and some of you don't look for yourselves <laughs> verify it by yourselves. That's why I always think it's good for you. I encourage you, and I hope that you have Bibles for yourselves. Don't, don't just take my word for granted. You should trust me, or I shouldn't be your pastor. But, but still, you should have your, your, your copy of Scripture yourself so you can read it for yourselves and study it for yourselves. God doesn't just speak to me. He speaks to you, too, through His Word. Right. <laughs> he wants them to verify these things. If they were unwilling to believe Paul regarding the resurrection of Christ, there were, there were other ways they could verify it for themselves. The first way that Paul offered was the witness of Scripture. Just look to the Scriptures, right? Paul decides that the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ happened just like the Scriptures said it would happen. Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. Christ was buried according to the Scriptures. Christ rose again the third day according to the scriptures. This, this is all the way it's supposed to be. This is what God's word has, has said. Psalm 22 and Psalm uh, and Isaiah 53 describe the death, burial, and resurrection nearly step by step. Hundreds of years before it ever happened. Isn't it amazing? It's amazing when you think about that. In fact, Jesus was quoting from Psalm 22 1 when he cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me from the cross? That wasn't just a random thing that he did. He wasn't just a just as kind of the words that came to him. This was scripture that he was speaking. I think we're pretty familiar with Isaiah 53. So let's, let's look at a few other verses from Psalm 22 and stay. I think we're less familiar with it. Psalm 22, verses 14 and 18 says this. It says, I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It has melted within me. My strength is dried up like a pot shirt, and my tongue clings to my jaws. You have brought me to the dust of death, for dogs have surrounded me. The congregation of the wicked has enclosed me. They pierce my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They look at and, and stare at me, and they divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. That sound familiar? Kind of ring a bell? 
David went through some difficult times to be sure, but he never experienced what was being described in these five verses. But you know who did? Christ. Christ did. He experienced all of them. Verse 16 was clearly describing what happened to Christ when he was crucified. And again, this psalm was written hundreds of years before crucifixion was made into a common form of capital punishment for criminals by the Romans. Right? This was rare. This was unusual for that to be written at that time period. Why? It was prophetic. It was prophetic. That's what it was. Psalm 16, 9 and 10 is another passage of Scripture that David wrote that foretold of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. It says this. It says, Therefore my heart is glad and my glory rejoices. My flesh also will rest in hope, for you will not leave my soul in Sheol, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. Did you notice that your Holy One is in caps? There's a reason for that. David wasn't talking about himself here. David may have very well been talking about himself in verses 9 and maybe even the first line of verse 10, but he certainly wasn't talking about himself when he wrote, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. Who's that talking about? Christ. Christ. God the Father would allow God the Son to experience death in the grave, but He would not allow Him to experience the corruption of death in the grave. How would He prevent that from happening? Through the resurrection. Through the resurrection. Christ rose again on the third day, just like the Scriptures foretold that He would. So knowing that all that we know, knowing all that we know about Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, who else could these prophetic passages have been talking about? Who else? Mm -hmm. No one. No one but Jesus. No one but Christ. Jesus even bore witness to his own death, burial, and resurrection by comparing himself to the prophet Jonah in Matthew 12, 39 to 41. He says, but, but he answered, again, debating with religious leaders as he did often. He said, but he answered and said to them, an evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will rise up in the judgment with this generation and condemn it, because they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and indeed a greater than Jonah is here. Wow. So per per perhaps, I would say, knowing that some of the Corinthians may have been skeptical of the witness of Scripture. Do you know any believers that are, are still skeptical of the witness of Scripture? Right? They may not voice it all the time, but they kind of, you know, I'm not sure about that. I, I know the Bible says that, but I don't know about, we know people like that. And, and, some, and some of you might be people like that. Right? You just don't always accept the witness of Scripture. So, so Paul turned it up a little notch and he got a little more personal and so he turned to eyewitness accounts or eyewitnesses of the resurrection of Christ and Paul didn't just give one or two he gave six right six individuals or groups of people that personally encountered Christ after his resurrection uh, from the dead verse 5 tells that Peter uh, uh, saw Christ after his resurrection right the Cephas that's that's just Aramaic uh, for Peter uh, and I would say, actually, Peter and John were uh, the first apostles to witness the empty tomb after the women came back and, and told them that the tomb was empty. We all remember that. It's kind of a funny story. They both run to the tomb, and John, probably being much younger, uh, you know, passed him up and got there, and, you know, you know, all that kind of, anyway. Verse 5 also tells us that the twelve uh, saw Christ together after his resurrection. Uh, they were known as the twelve. Again, you're saying, well, hang on a second. After the resurrection, there wasn't twelve, there were eleven. You're right, Judas was gone, but they were still known as the Twelve. Right. Right, they, they hadn't changed the name of the group yet. Right? They were still known as the Twelve, even though they were eleven. But they took care of that later in Acts. Right? And so that, that's what he's saying there. You remember, he appeared to them in the room. Peace be with you. And they all, ah! Right? They kind of freaked out, panicked that he just showed up. And we would too, right? Yeah. He, he, we, the last time we saw him, he was dead. And all of a sudden, now he's here in the midst of us. That would you know, cause a kind of a, a bit of a panic. A little bit of excitement. And so they all saw him together. He appeared to them together. And, and then in verse 6 tells us that Christ was seen by over 500 people at one time. And Paul even offered the Corinthians to go and ask them for themselves because some of them were still alive. right? Some of them 
had fallen asleep, right? That's another word for believers when they die, right? Just fall, it's like falling asleep. But some of them were still alive. Just if you don't believe the, the scriptures and you, and you don't trust apostles, there are some other people here you can go ask for yourself. Ask them. They saw. We don't have any specific account of, of, of this gathering or this happening in scriptures, but, but, but Paul has it here for us. The point that Paul was making was that many people outside of the apostles could testify to the fact that Christ had risen from the dead. Right? If, if you don't trust scriptures, you don't, you don't trust the, uh, the apostles, don't trust me, there's lots of other people you can go to and find out for yourself that you can verify the resurrection is true. And next, in, in verse 7, it tells us that James, uh, likely the half-brother of Jesus, saw him as well. If you remember James, he, he was embarrassed of Jesus. Right, Growing up and, and, and the rest of the siblings there in the family, they... They were embarrassed of, of Jesus, and they were to, they were, because he was going around and the, the teachings that he was saying, and they, they kind of thought he was either wore out or, or, or maybe he's a little off his rocker, and so he was embarrassed of him. Right, all these claims of being the Messiah prior to the resurrection, but after the resurrection, something changed in James. Something what changes? He saw his brother. So that his brother had risen from the dead, that he was the Messiah, right? That everything that he said, that he was, it wasn't crazy talk, it was true. He became the leader of the church in Jerusalem and died as a martyr for his faith in Christ. Do you think you would have died as a martyr for someone or, 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 or for, for Christ if he wasn't raised from the dead? Right? I don't think you would. None of the apostles would, for that matter. Verse 7 also tells that the risen Christ was seen by all the rest of the apostles. I think... What, what's being applied here, or maybe a, an understanding of what's happening here, is these are probably other men that met the qualifications of apostles, right? That, that, they, that they would spend significant time uh, with uh, with Jesus, uh, following him before before his uh, before his death, and so. And then, and lastly, in verse eight, Paul included himself as an eyewitness, as one born out of due time. I don't think Paul ever lost the feeling of being unworthy to be an apostle. I think that that was kind of a thorn in his flesh. You know, we don't know what the other thorn is. Maybe this is this. He, he had a hard time reconciling what he had done. And then God still showing him grace and, and still calling him out to be an apostle. I don't think he ever got over that. All, right, all the great harm he had done to the church before Christ saved him and set him apart to be an apostle to the Gentiles. He never got over it. <coughs> If the Corinthians were skeptical of the Scriptures, there were plenty of eyewitness accounts available, some of which were still alive. So they could just, Paul said, go ask them. And so, what's the bottom line for us today? The resurrection of Christ is 100% verifiable to us from the Scriptures. Amen. We don't have any apostles, right? right. right? <laughs> Though some people will call themselves apostles. We don't, we don't have these apostles. Yeah. Amen. Right? We don't. But we have the, the written accounts of these eyewitnesses, right? All that we have before us. We have the Word of God before us. We don't have any uh, living eyewitnesses of the resurrection, but we have their eyewitness accounts recorded for us in the pages of the New Testament. The resurrection of Christ is verifiable. It's, it's not a matter of having enough proof, right? That for people that say, I just can't believe, I, if I just have more proof. No, it's not. There's sufficient proof. That's right. Right? The, the, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ is verifiable. So it's not about having enough proof. The issue is having enough faith to accept the proof that we have. Yeah. Right? Having the faith to accept the proof that we have. To say, well, that's, that leads to another question. Where, where does faith come from? It comes from God. That's right. It comes from God. Primarily by the hearing of the Word of God. Romans 10, 17. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God, the testimony of Scripture. Number three, the third truth that we see in our text regarding the resurrection of Christ is that the resurrection of Christ is transformational. It's transformational, verses 9 to 11. For I am the least of the apostles who am not worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and by His grace toward me was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Therefore, whether it was I or they, so we preach, and so you believe. Paul is not someone that had believed the, 
the gospel in vain. Therefore, God's grace towards them was not in vain either. In fact, I would say God's grace towards us is never in vain. Right? God's grace towards us, His saving grace towards us is never in vain. Paul was humbled by the fact that God would extend him grace after the way that he had persecuted the church. For Paul, it didn't make any sense for God to do that. And for some of us, Myself included. It doesn't make any sense that God would save someone like me. The way I lived my life before Christ saved me. The things I said, the things I did, the, the things I said about God, the things I said about God's Word and God's people, the way I made fun of Christians and all these things that I can understand where, where Paul is coming from. It didn't make sense. But that is precisely what God did for him and everyone else that believes the Gospel. It doesn't always make sense. It shouldn't make sense. You, we, we don't deserve God's mercy and grace, but that's why it's called mercy and grace. That's right. You don't deserve mercy and grace. I don't deserve mercy and grace. But that's exactly what God has given. The death, burial, and resurrection of Christ didn't only make reconciliation with God possible, it also made transformation into Christ's likeness possible too. Right? So it's not just about what happens to us when we die, right? The, 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 where we'll spend eternity and who we spend eternity with. We're being made like Christ now. We're experiencing transformation right now. The, the word that we see or that we know it as is sanctification. Right? Becoming more and more like Christ. You see, believing the gospel doesn't transform bad people into good people. Believing the gospel transforms dead people into new creations. Amen. New creations. 2 Corinthians 5.17 Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. The reason that Paul could, could write these words is because that was a testimony of his transformation once he believed the gospel. He, he wasn't just saying, this is for y'all. This is for me. I have been made a new creation. All things have become new to me as well. Once he encountered the resurrected Christ on the Damascus Road, he was never, never, never the same person again. All things had indeed become new about him. Paul's entire life was radically transformed when he placed his faith in Christ. Paul went from being the top persecutor of the church to being the top church planner. How about that? Someone who's trying to shut down churches to someone who is planting new churches. Paul went from being someone that locked up Christians in prison to being someone that, that was being locked up in prison because he was a Christian. How about that? A, a complete reversal, right? The exact opposite. Paul went from being someone that hated Christ and anyone that followed Christ to being someone that deeply loved Christ and that and deeply loved anyone that else that followed Christ. He was a changed man. Amen. He wasn't a better man. He was a new man. And the same thing goes for us. So I would just ask you this morning, have you become a new creation in Christ? Has your life been radically transformed by believing the gospel? Right? You say, well, I wouldn't say radically. Okay, I'll back off of that statement. Some, some people's sanctification is more dramatic than others. Can we agree on that? Right? You know? And, and, so, and so for Paul, it was dramatic. But I'll just ask that. Let me just... Has your life been transformed? Is your life being transformed by the gospel? Because that's the way it works. Right? Some of the Corinthians rejected Paul as an apostle, and, and Paul may not have counted himself worthy to be called an apostle, but guess what? God did. God did. Isn't that what matters most? It doesn't matter what, what you think of me or I think of you ultimately. That's not what really matters. I want you to think well of me, and I want to be able to think well of you. But ultimately, what matters to me and what should matter to you is what God thinks about you. Amen. What God says about you. Who God says you are. That's what should matter. Paul responded to God's calling on his life as an apostle with an unmatched zeal to preach the gospel to as many people as he could in as many places as he could. That dude got around. Right. Right? We're talking about the first century. It ain't like they have trains and planes and buses and automobiles. This is... This is uh, on ships, on foot, on donkey, 
right? It, it was difficult to get around, and he did the best that he could. The grace of God was in Paul enabled and empowered him to labor more abundantly than any of the other apostles. And I would just, I would just add there, I believe what he's talking about is the scope of his work. Because the other apostles were faithful too, and they worked, they labored. But I think what he's talking about is that he was able, God allowed him to reach more people in more places than the rest. I think that's maybe a more, more accurate uh, statement of, of what he was talking about there. Paul was humbled by the fact that God would save such a wretch like him. Paul was also humbled that God would send them out to preach the gospel so that other wretches like you and me could also be saved. That we could hear the same gospel that made him a new creation as he did and be gloriously transformed. If your life has been transformed by the gospel, you have been given the ministry of reconciliation. And like Paul, you too are an ambassador for Christ. You say, Brother Mike, I, uh, where does the Bible say that? Well, continue in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, right after the verse 17, 18 through 21 says, Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ, and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. Who's us? Us. We're part of the us. Those who have believed in Christ, those who have been made new creations, the ones that all things have become new, us. We're us, right? We're, we're part of the us there. We, he has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to, again, there it is, us, us, the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are, we, 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 us, we, us and we, we we're part of this. We are ambassadors for Christ as though God were pleading through us. We implore <laughs> you on Christ's behalf be reconciled to God for He made Him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteous of God in Him. That's the Gospel. That's, right. That's the Gospel. Let me share one more uh, statement by Danny Aiken and his perspective on Paul from these verses and then we'll, we'll land this plane. It says the transparency and honesty of Paul is both heartwarming and breathtaking. He fully admits he is the least of all apostles. He should not even be called an apostle. He was the ultimate anti-apostle by persecuting God's church, but it was the resurrected Lord who saved him by grace, changed him by grace, and empowered him with grace to do the work that he did and become the person that he became. The same thing could be said of all of us that have placed our faith in Christ. The same exact thing. There's no denying that Paul's life was transformed by believing the gospel. If you have believed the gospel, could the same thing be said about you? People that knew you before you professed faith in Christ, could they, would they say the same thing about you? I, I knew you. I knew you before you did whatever you did over there at that church. You ain't the same anymore. You're different. What's different about you? There's the open door. Let me tell you what's different about me. I just meet Jesus. Jesus found me. Not only did He find me, He saved me. He gave me a new heart. He gave me a new life. He gave me a new calling. He transformed me into a new creation. I've been born again. See, the resurrection of Christ is transformational. Right? The, the, the gospel is transformational. The resurrection of Christ is transformational. If you haven't been transformed by the gospel, then you haven't believed the gospel. If you have believed the gospel, you are a new creation in Christ. All things have become new about you. That's not my opinion. That's, that's God's word. That's what God's word says. So in closing this morning, there's no, there's, there's no such thing as a resurrection denying Christian. Wow. If you ever meet someone that denies the resurrection of Jesus, that claims they're a Christian, they're not a Christian. This is, this is not possible. You can either be a Christian or you can be a resurrection denier, but you can't be both. That's right. That was the point that Paul was starting to make here in these opening 11 verses. It was unthinkable, it was unfathomable for Paul that, that a teaching of like this had made its way into the church of Corinth that denied the resurrection of Christ. 
to deny the resurrection of Christ is to deny the finished work of Christ. That's big. That's right. Like to deny the resurrection of Christ is to deny the finished work of Christ. The, the resurrection of Christ is what makes the work of Christ finished. That is the finishing act, right? It wasn't just that he died, that it is that he it was and that he was buried, that he rose again. That's the that's, right. that's the finishing. That's the, the God had accepted his offering. Deny one part of the gospel is to deny, deny all of the gospel. If there was no resurrection of Christ, then there is no forgiveness of sins. If there is no forgiveness of sins, there is no gospel, there is no redemption, and there is no way for sins to be recon back, reconciled back to God. Guess what there is? Only condemnation. The resurrection matters. Praise God, that's not the reality that we live in. Praise God, the resurrection of Christ did happen. Praise God, the gospel is true. Praise God, the redemption price for our sin has been paid in full. Praise God, reconciliation with God and everlasting life is promised to those who believe in Christ as Lord and Savior. Praise God. John 3, 16 and 17. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. If you have not believed in Christ, your Lord and Savior yet, the invitation for you today is believe in Him. Amen. Repent of your sins and believe in Him as your Lord and Savior and you will be saved today. You will be saved today. All right, so that's my invitation to you. For the rest of us, let's rejoice. Rejoice. Let's be ever grateful. We've been reminded of the resurrection of Christ and its implications on our lives. Because Christ was raised to live, guess what we, we know? We'll be raised from the dead too. Amen? Amen. Right. Let me pray for us and we'll have a time of response. Father in heaven, God, we thank you so much for the resurrection of Christ. You had a plan to redeem fallen humanity from before the foundations of the, of the, of the, of the world. And your plan never fails. Anything that you set forth to do, that, that, that you set your uh, mind to do anything that you uh, have given us in your word, any promise that you make to us, we can be certain that you will keep it. God, we thank you for the promise of everlasting life. We thank you for the promise of forgiveness of sins. We thank you for uh, your, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, the one that not only died for our sins, not only was buried for our sins, but the one that was raised from the dead three days later for our sins. God, help us to be a people that appreciates the resurrection of Christ, that is forever grateful for the resurrection of Christ. Help us to be a resurrection people. Help us to be a gospel people. Help us to be faithful to, to, to share the good news of not just his, Jesus' death, not just His burial, but also His resurrection. For without the resurrection, we would have no hope. We would be condemned in our sins. And so, Father, help us to do that. And God, I do pray for any that are here this morning with us, maybe some that might be watching online this morning, or someone that may hear this message down the road. God, I pray that as your word is go word has gone forth this morning, that faith has gone forth. And faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And so, God, I pray that you would do a saving work through your word here this morning. Uh, through Facebook Live or, or, or even later if someone hears God, I, I believe your word. I was saved by the word and, and everyone who is saved is also saved by the word. And so God, we believe that you'll do that. And so Father, thank you again for this time that you've given us this morning, God. Help us who have believed, help us to, to hide this word away in our hearts, that, that help us to meditate on it, help us to ponder on it, help us to appreciate the resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ. We, we pray these things in His name this morning. Amen.